Um, yeah, that started recording. So we're going to talk about, well, more OSCE things, like I said. And the first thing we'll talk about is prescribing, but we'll also be just talking about some OSCE stuff in general after that. If you've got any OSCE related questions or whatever, ask them at what chef for, well, yeah, whichever point you want. I think I said earlier before most of you joined, if you've got any questions, just tell, ask me and I'm going to stick around till everyone's left the call to answer any questions. So yeah, anything you've got, bring them to me. So, starting with prescribing. This is your first scenario. So you've got a man, his name is so good, so good, awesome. Totally not inspired by the Denmark game yesterday. He's 57 and he has returned to the ward after an uncomplicated elective cholecystectomy for gallstones. Uh, it's 3 p.m. on a Thursday. So you've been asked by the grudge to assess him, not because he's unwell or anything, just because he's come back to the ward and he's coming around from the general anesthetic, see how he's doing. First question I want to ask you guys is what are the what symptoms do you want to specifically ask about in order to inform your decision making about what you're going to prescribe? And think of it in terms of what are the most common post-op symptoms. Well, so you've got pain, dehydration, any signs of infection, pain. Let's go for pain, nausea, good. Vomiting, temperature, good. Excellent. You've basically covered the most important ones. I wanted shortness of breath, good. So basically, general practice, anytime you're seeing a patient, what are you going to do? What's step number one? I know it's defined for assessing the acutely unwell patient, but just good practice. It's a nice little stepwise thing to follow. Even if it's assessing a relatively stable patient. Structure, so you can pick up on things. Yeah. So that's you and Pierre have said, you do your HOE assessment, and you've noted most of the important symptoms. Pain's a really important one. Why is pain, why is managing pain quite important in post-op patients? There are certain things that people don't do or don't want to do with pain. So it can decrease or increase rest rate, further problems. So Roger, you've mentioned it can cause atelectasis. What's the mechanism for that? Effects recovery, less force. Good, excellent. When we're in pain. We don't want to move around as much. Moving around is quite important. Post up reduces VTE risk, all that stuff, returns you to your functional baseline. It hurts to breathe, particularly if it's upper abdominal or thoracic surgery. If you don't breathe as well, you don't take in as deep breaths. If you're not taking in as deep breaths, you're more vulnerable to infection because you're not clearing stuff as well. Uh, so pain's impro crucially important to deal with. So pain. Nausea as well. Nausea is incredibly uncomfortable and distressing. And you've mentioned some other really important ones which come up during the ATP assessment, like shortness of breath, things like signs and symptoms of infection, recarpin the OB. So these are all crucial, which is excellent. Um, thinking about infection actually after an operation, if somebody did develop, let's say, a wound site infection or an infection because of, let's say it's abdominal surgery and there's been contamination, so a sterile field hasn't been maintained. How quickly do you reckon infection will come on? This guy's just come off of, um, like has maybe come out the theater an hour or two ago. Can you do does? Yeah, so if, for example, um, there'd been some contamination due to, they perforated the abdomen or something, and some abdominal contents had gotten into the surgical field and somehow someone hadn't noticed, which is incredibly unlikely. You probably wouldn't notice immediately. In fact, by now, the patient might not even be showing signs. It might be a couple of hours later, sometimes in the first 24 hours. A wound site infection in the first few days, a deeper infection can take even longer to show. But So it's always good practice to track temperatures. But within the first few hours, you're unlikely to find anything. Excellent. Right. So we've covered the most important ones, the stuff that come up in the HV assessment, which is mainly OBS and things like chest pain and shortness of breath and whatever. But just the more 
being a nice human being and facilitating recovery by getting rid of distressing symptoms. So we're talking about stuff like, are you feeling nauseated? Are you feeling thirsty? Can you, you know, do you think you're able to eat? Things like that. Excellent. So those are the most common post-op things. So pain, nausea and vomiting. You might also after abdominal surgery get stuff like constipation. What's the most common cause of constipation after abdominal surgery? Why do patients who get abdominal surgery get constipation? Good, ideas. excellent. Opiates, is pro opiates for analgesia is going to be the most common cause of constipation after any operation. Very good. So, but after abdominal surgery, ileus is the biggest cause. So you're not moving, you've basically been chucking around the person's bowels as a response, they just stop moving. So you get paralytic ileus, ileus uh, being just paralysis of smooth muscle, which is why terms like gallstone ileus uh, are a misnomer, because gallstone ileus is actually an obstruction rather than actual true ileus. After any operation, if you did them all, all together rather than just abdominal, well then opiates are the most common cause. Excellent. Um, bowel obstruction will take long. Adhe so adhesions causing small bowel obstruction will take longer to manifest. In fact, that's usually a few months, for example. Uh, but excellent. You're all doing. Yeah, you're all, you're all doing spot on. Well done. So you've spoken to this man, and he's saying something like, "Oh, I've got." Um, I've got four out of 10 pain, just sort of generally. And all of his recent, po all of his post-op observations are normal. And he's just saying he's a bit nauseated. He can drink, but he's not feeling like food because fluids, uh, sorry, he's not feeling like food because he's feeling nauseated. Um, on that point, why is asking about the severity of pain quite important? Seems like a bit of an obvious dumb question, but why is it so important? How bad is it on a scale of one to ten? Seems like such a cliche thing, but there is a there is a point of importance here, and it is to do with the pain ladder. Yeah, good. So Sylvia's made a really good point. It helps you because it's quantitative. It helps you track progress. But Zach has made an excellent point, which is informs you which rung on the ladder to start from. Because often we're taught start, you know, start low, go up, start with your um, start with your sort of lowest, mildest analgesics. But none of us, if a patient came in and they'd snapped their humerus in half and they're screaming in agony, would go, I'm gonna try some paracetamol and ibuprofen before I move on to codeine. No, that person's getting morphine straight away, which is why it's really important, because something I think which a lot of people get hung up on especially in fourth year is um can i go straight to this before trying this and in the case of pain and prescribing for pain yeah you absolutely can if someone's in agonizing pain then you're going straight to morphine even if, even if you're thinking oh i haven't given them paracetamol or anything yet well if you know that paracetamol is not going to touch it then absolutely go to cocodromol and if you think actually this is really really strong pain like this person's come in with a with a sequestration crisis because of sickle cell you're not giving them ibuprofen you're going straight to morphine so excellent that's why asking about the stratification of pain is really really important for this bit and this is a reasonable oski station for example you've been told this much information um let's add on to this um his, so his obs are all fine but you've also done the really important thing of doing a fluid status examination, which I forgot to put in there, and he's uvolemic from that. So he's not allergic to any medicines. His obs are fine. He's got four out of 10 in terms of pain, uh, and he's feeling a bit nauseated. And he's a post-op patient. Take three minutes, let's say. Yeah, three minutes to prescribe what you think is appropriate. I'll start a timer, and then we'll talk it through after that. And you can ask all the questions you want. But this is, yeah, in an actual exam, in the actual OSCE, it is highly unlikely that they will ask you to prescribe more than one or two things, to be honest. Usually it's just prescribing one drug or something like that. But in this case, prescribe whatever you think is appropriate. 
you've got three minutes and that is starting now. This is a 40 second reminder. Right, that brings us back. So let's start off with what did people think in terms of, uh, actually, yeah, no, better way to start. What, what did this patient need in terms of broad categories of medication or pharmacological support? Did this patient need any oxygen? Perfect. Did this patient need uh, any VTE prophylaxis? Soma, you don't want to say no oxygen, you say no oxygen because there's absolutely no need for oxygen, you're right. Yeah, did this patient need VTE prophylaxis? Yes, perfect, you need a VTE prophylaxis because he's a post-op patient, wonderful. Excellent. Uh, did this patient need any antibiotics? Nope, no indication for them. Wonderful. If there is an indication for antibiotics, you will be told because on F1, you're not making that decision. That's your consultant's call. Fantastic. Does this patient need any fluids? Okay. So doesn't need fluids. Why does so you'd yeah, you'd review why doesn't he need intravenous fluids? So sorry, maybe I should have sorry someone, maybe I should have specified does he need intravenous fluids? Yes. 
perfect. Yeah. If the patient can drink themselves, then I don't. That's perfect. Okay. Yeah. But just to make it clear, if the patient can drink, you don't put cannula in them. Um, if you guys remember from when you practiced cannulas on each other earlier in the year, cannulas aren't nice. You feel a little bit of plastic inside you. If they don't need a cannula, then don't don't give them a cannula. Cool. So we said fluids now. So what does this patient need then? So we've said VTE prophylaxis, excellent. What does the patient need? Yay, perfect. Painkillers and antiemetics, wonderful. So what have people gone for in terms of analgesia? What have people thought is you know, fair? And Jessica, I agree with you in terms of a laxative, but we'll see how people have prescribed it later, later on. So a laxative isn't something that, for example, actually, I haven't got a gen surge job, so I can't actually talk, but um, good. we'll talk about laxative in a second. Nice. Nice. I am particularly happy with everybody's answers. So I'll quickly put up, look, I'll put, I'll put up what I would have put. The thing is, none of you are particularly, like, there's no there's no wrong here's what i'm putting what I, i'm putting what i've put because i think that's what ucl will have wanted so on the regular which is top right i've put regular paracetamol and ibuprofen four out of ten pain it's mild moderate and so sylvia I completely agree with you but i don't think that's too low down paracetamol ibuprofen it's the f1's favorite that should cover all pain around to a like five out of ten thing then if you're worried that uh, maybe the patient um, might feel more pain or maybe they're understating their pain, you can always put something stronger PRN. And that's something that I want you guys to take away from this. If you're thinking, oh, maybe that's not enough, maybe paracetamol is not enough, then if you want to, just put on a PRN painkiller, which is a bit stronger. stronger. So in this case, I've gone for codeine. So as Zach, you said weak opioid, perfect. And put that on the PRN side. And the easiest thing to do is just to note that if the patient is using their PRNs a lot, then you can make it their regular. So, oh, this person's now using their codeine four times a day. What can I prescribe now? That's a good question. So is it around seven, eight, you start giving, giving regular op uh, opioids? What other information might you want other than just what the patient's saying. And I do hate that I'm having to say this, but there is a reason for why I'm saying it. So yeah, like if somebody was saying, I've got like nine out of 10 pain, I'm thinking, uh, I pr probably should be giving you an opioid. Yeah, have they tried it? Have they tried anything else? But also do they look like they're actually in pain? It sucks, but hospitals are a good place to get strong painkillers. And we know that strong painkillers are addictive. So people may come in looking for, uh, people may come in looking for morphine, for example. If someone's coming in, they say, oh, I've got really, really bad pain. And you're looking at them, you're thinking, I don't know, I don't know. Mm, I'm not sure. Usually you can tell if somebody is in is in agony. I don't know if anyone, for example, this year has seen somebody with a kidney stone. You can tell when somebody's got a kidney stone. At that point, you're thinking, OK, we're giving you we're not giving you oral paracetamol. Kidney stones are a bit different because obviously their ideal thing is diclofenac rectally or intramuscular. So it's not opioids, but you can usually tell. So assess for pain, like uh, also assess for pain yourself. But yeah, I would say around like if a patient's going, what, like, my pain's 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 10, then I'm thinking, I should probably give you regular aura morph. Maddie's asked a really good question, which is, should we put painkillers PR, uh, PRN? My opinion is no. Put, pain, put mild painkillers regular and anything stronger than that for now, you can put it PRN. And if they start using it, then you can make it regular. The reason for that is... I don't like the idea of wait until the patient's in pain before giving something to them. If you anticipate pain, or if the patient's already reporting pain, give them painkiller regularly. The thing is, after an operation, 
pain should get less with time. But rather than waiting for pain to happen and then treating it, I always think the best thing to do is to give them regular paracetamol and ibuprofen for the first few days, for example, and then you can start stopping it. And if they start getting in pain, then carry on again. If they don't, then just put it PRN because you're going to hurt after an operation. Just put it put it on the regular side. So that's why I think putting it regularly makes sense. You're going to be in pain after an operation. How do you decide whether the drug should be PRN or regular? If the person's definitely going to have a symptom, give it regular. If you think the patient might have a symptom, or if the symptom is intermittent, then PRN. So for example, the patient says he's feeling the patient says he's feeling nauseated. So in this case, I don't think anyone would be penalized for deciding to put this, uh, the anti-emetic regularly or for putting it or for putting it PRN because it's they're like, oh, I don't feel nauseated all the time. It just comes and goes, okay, well, you can ask for it when you're feeling nauseated. So my hard and fast rules are if it is a constant or predictable symptom, then put it regularly. If it is an intermittent or yeah, if it's an intermittent symptom, or an unpredictable one, put it PRN. That's the way I look at it. So I've put paracetamol and ibuprofen as regulars because it's going to be in pain. And if he's in more pain, give him codeine. Specifically noting that if he needs lots of codeine, tell me so then I can make it regular and then I can switch that to cocodamol. He's feeling sick, so have some cyclizine. If you put the antiemetic as a regular medication, you would get the mark for that because he's feeling sick. Why wouldn't you? Because he might take quite a bit of codeine and he might get constipated. That's a really good question. Would you prescribe PPI with the ibuprofen as well? At this point in time, no, because after a cholecystectomy, you're not going to be in hospital for that long. What time period do people think you should start prescribing a PPI on somebody who's taking an NSAID? Like how long would you want your after how long of a patient taking an NSAID daily would you start thinking, hmm, PPI? So four weeks is a solid about I would generally feel I would so what Patrick's gone for. So two at, at about two weeks, I'm starting to feel like, oh, maybe I should put you on a PPI. So a week is cautious and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with caution. I know some people who'd say a week. I'd go for two weeks. That's a lie, actually. I'd ask my consultant or my or the GP partner or something. But on a gut instinct, if someone was like, yo, I've been using ibuprofen for six weeks now, I'd go, huh, you probably need some omeprazole. Uh, it also depends on the PPI as well. So ibuprofen, two weeks, I'd be like, yeah, you know what, as long as you're not using it for longer than that, should be okay. And as long as you're having it with meals and whatever. Somebody who's using a proxen, on the other hand, at that point, I'd be going, I kind of just want you to have a PPI if you're taking a proxen. A good example, actually, is my mum who's got osteoarthritis and she has PRN in naproxen, but immediately from the off, she was given a meprazole with the naproxen because naproxen is strong, much stronger than ibuprofen. But that was a really, really good question, and I'm glad you asked that. So because the patient after a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which is an elective one, is probably not going to be in for too long, I wouldn't prescribe a PPO with their ibuprofen. However, if the patient is going to be taking ibuprofen for a prolonged period of time, more than two weeks, in my opinion, I'd prescribe a PPO. If um, it was naproxen that I was giving them for a musculoskeletal thing, I'd give them a PPI as well. There's no hard and fast guidelines for when to start prescribing a PPI with ibuprofen. But step one, ask your senior. Step two, be on the safe side. Like a week is safe. If they're taking it for more than a week, give them a PPI, that's safe. So really good question. So Senna, given Senna, because just in case he starts taking the codeine, he might start feeling constipated. Yes, I wanted this question. Thank you. How do we choose between cyclozine or metoclopramide for an antiemetic? You pick whatever the hell you want. Can someone tell me why I've gone for cyclozine instead of metoclopramide, though? Why, why have I picked cyclozine? Because I'm going to have a recommendation for you on the next slide. But yeah, less contraindications. Good, excellent. So, 
So I've gone for I've gone for cycl cyclozine because less contraindications. What I'm going to tell you on the next slide, if instead I'm going to tell you now, is even though you're going to have access during your prescribing stations, you're going to have access to the digital BNF. I think it will save you all a lot of time if you just memorize doses for one antiemetic, one laxative, so that you know, oh, this is a station where, okay, patient's feeling nauseated, I'll just pre prescribe them an antiemetic instead of having to go and, okay, it won't take long to take the 15 seconds to look up cyclozine and find out that it's 50 to 150 milligrams up to three times a day. Still 15 seconds. You can use that 15 seconds on something else. So some people go with metoclopramide. Some people go, oh, yeah, I just take, I can't have to remember the dose for metoclopramide because it's not the one that I memorize. But the reason why I've picked cyclozine is I like it because it doesn't have as many contraindications as metoclopramide does. So metoclopramide, for example, contra contraindicated in obstruction, contraindicated in Parkinson's disease. So whilst I say pick whatever the hell you want, my personal recommendation is cyclozine. It's a nice flat number, 50 milligrams, three times a day. And if they're nauseated, you just give them cyclozine and you just remember that number and it's nice and easy. But that's why I've picked that's why I picked cyclozine. You don't in events where you need to choose, the choice is made but for you by guidelines, basically. So there are some guidelines or some scenarios that are like, oh, give metoclopramide for these people. Like for example, in um, in MIs, I think one of them is preferred. I'm not sure which one. I'll get back to you on that one, actually. But in specific presentations where a per person will be vomiting, sometimes it will specify, use this antiemetic as first line, use this one as second line. Um, but otherwise, if it's just, eh, my patient's a bit nauseated or my patient's vomiting, I like cyclozine because it's the one which I find easiest to remember. Um, if it... How do you choose between 20 and oxyparin? If it's like 50 milligrams up to three times a day, is it better to go for the highest dose first? Um, I like going for the lowest dose first. So for example, the range of cyclozine is 50 to 150 milligrams up to three times a day. So the most you can technically give is 450 milligrams a day. I like starting with 50 for in cyclozine's example, in cyclozine's example, because if it works and they're not getting any side effects, then great. Whereas if I started with 150 and it worked, but they were having side effects, then I'd kind of have to then go down and try, okay, what about 100? Okay, 100 sounds right. Whereas I think it's more pleasant for the patient where they don't need to, where they don't need to, um, they don't need to worry about uh, side effects. So if I started at 15, it's like, I still feel a bit nauseated. I can go up to 100. I start at l the lower number just to minimize the chance of side effects. And if it works, then it works. Um, how do you choose between 20 milligrams and 40? So that was in the BNF. So for a general surgical patient, it is 20 milligrams for noxaparin. For a orthopedic patient, it's 40 milligrams. For a medical patient, it's 40 milligrams, which is why most of you all have seen 40. Um, but that's literally just based on the BNF. Do you write anything in the additional information section in this case? So for cyclozine and for Senna, I wouldn't because there's not really anything I need to say for that. Does it matter what time you schedule drug admin administration? So in an OSCE, no. In an OSCE, well, in, in an OSCE, so like, oh uh, yeah, they can have it at midnight, what matters? In real life, absolutely. You're not, like, it's kind of annoying for the patient. But in real in an OSCE, um, the only one that really matters for is something like paracetamol, where you can't give it any less frequent, uh, so any more frequently than every six hours. Otherwise, if it's a QDS drug and you're in an OSCE, just give it at midnight. No one's going to mark you down for that. In real life, then it's sort of like, oh, maybe we can make two of the doses closer together so that we're not annoying the patient. And instead of every six hours, this dose is every four hours. But in an OSCE, give it at midnight. Doesn't matter. Space it out. Uh, for the PRN section, yep, you can put the range of the dose, and that is something which can be done for things like uh, opiates, for example, like, oh, um, give them 2.5 milligrams of oromorph, but if that doesn't work, the next time give them five. So in the in the dose part of um, in the dose part of PRN, on a PR on a yeah on the dose part of PRN, you can put a, you can put a range. In regular, I haven't seen ranges given. It's only on PRNs where I've seen ranges given. But you can definitely put the range of a dose um, on PRNs. However, I will point out it's not regarded as good practice, and the pharmacist will call you out on it if you do it.
like it's not illegal and the nurses sometimes do like it i've seen some of them be like yay they've got a range this is nice because i know that my patient likes the higher end of the range and i don't have to call up the doctor again to ask the pharmacists don't like it however so good practice is to only put one number and not a range of numbers does that hopefully that's answered all the questions let me just double check we talked about why i chose cyclozine Maddie asked, um, is it best to go for the highest dose? I prefer going for the lowest dose to minimize the chance of side effects. Um, and that's, I think, us answered all the questions. Any more questions about that? Go for it. We talked about why it's 20, because that's what the BNF says. Um, if it's a medical patient, then 40. However, bear in mind, for example, that in my fourth year prescribing station, it was prescribed VT prophylaxis, but they threw in the curveball of this patient's GFR is 43. I think it was 43 and then you had to adjust for, you had to adjust for dose um is center the best la best laxative to go for laxatives are an annoying one and again this is a question i'm glad you asked because um center is the one you'll see most often in hospitals and that's why i like uh, i like going for it and um, also because you can just give it as a pill the other one you'll see most often is macrogol but macrogol is actually indicated for chronic constipation rather than for acute constipation. So Senna is the one I like the most because it's a pill, um, whereas Macrogol is sachets and just like the idea of prescribing stuff in milligrams. Uh, and Senna doesn't really have contraindications apart from when would you not want to give somebody Senna actually considering its mechanism of action. That's a roundabout way. My answer is Senna is the laxative I go for because it's a nice 7.5 to 15 milligrams and I always put 7.5 and just once a day rather than two sachets at this time. Yeah, you don't want to use an obstruction because Senna is a pro it's a stimulant laxative, um, but you're probably not going to be giving somebody a laxative obstruction anyway. Okie doke. If anybody's got any more questions about that stuff, then ask just real quick. We've already talked about this bit why it's really important to assess the severity of pain. And for the OSCE, my recommendations are, remember the dose of paracetamol, remember the dose of ibuprofen, pick an antiemetic, um, laxative, I'm less keen on memorizing one because it depends on the scenario. Like we said, you're not gonna give somebody Senna if they've got obstruction, but the one that always comes to my mind first is Senna. It's either gonna be Senna or Macrogol and the other ones like Lactulose and Docusate and whatever, I've seen more in specific scenarios rather than put in particularly generally. How do you adjust VT prophylaxis and renal and PEM? You look at what the BNF tells you to do, or or they give you local guidance. So, for example, uh, for things like anoxaparin, on the BNF it just says reduce dose in renal impairment, which isn't very useful. In the OSCE, it said here is the local guidance for VT, uh, for prescribing anox uh, for prescribing anoxaparin based on um, yeah, based adjusting for renal impairment. And it said, if GFR below 45, half the dose. And you just did that. So sometimes it can be quite nice in the OSCE and they will give you the information that you need. So in real life, how would I adjust it in renal impairment? Ask my reg or look it up to date or something because the BNF isn't very helpful in that case. In the OSCE, they gave me the information for that. So. If they want you to adjust for renal impairment, if the BNF doesn't say it, I'll give you an example of local guidance. Same thing with antibiotics, for example. If you're worried, wait, what antibiotic do I give if a patient's penicillin is allergic? In the OSCE, they'll say, here are your local, you know, here are your local guidelines for the good hospital. If patient is penicillin allergic with a curb score of three plus, give them this antibiotic. So for prescribing stations, they tend to give you all the information that you need. Okay. Moving on to this bit, so this is more of a general OSCE stuff that we kind of do have a, a scenario around it, but this is basically to make a point of the fact that in the OSCE, while they're stressful, so the thing that helps the most is having a structure, and having a structure is the reason why practically everybody passes and usually does quite well in OSCEs, because uh, the reality is, for most things, you already know a structure, you already know a structure to follow when you're taking history, Examinations, you already know a structure. A to E assessments, you already know a structure. Prescribing, the structure is basically go through each section and make sure, see if 
do they need something here? No. Do they need something here? No. Practical skills, there is a structure, which is follow whatever the mark scheme is. So you're sort of left with the explanation stuff. So explanation you can break down into, am I explaining results? Am I explaining a procedure? Am I explaining medication and stats? Or is it something like uh, do not attempt resuscitation or whatever? And it's harder to think of an intuitive structure for those. So we'll talk about that a bit through the scenario of this vignette. Um, so I've oh got, sorry, give me a sec to move the actual slide on because it's refusing to do so. You're an F1 in this scenario, and you've got uh, Sahiba Hussain, she's a 67 year old lady. She's had a STEMI and she's been discharged with Ramipril, Bisoprol, Tovastat, and Aspirin and Cloppy. And she's never had any of those before. So counsel her on her new prescription. You won't get this as an OSCE station because there's five medicines here. In an OSCE station, you'll probably only have to tell her about one of them, at most maybe two. So we'll go through this together, all 43 of us. Let's assume you started off the, you know, hi, my name is, I'm one of the F1s, etc. How do you want to start off? And this is something which is consistent for all explanation stations. Good. So those are the two most, two most important things. Wonderful. Ah, I'm liking this. I'm very happy. You are all going to do spectacularly well. Good. So you're talking, you're talking, you're talking, for example, in this case, to a patient. So tell me a bit about what's happened so far, which is an excellent place to start. And she'll say, well, I had this happen, and then the doctors told me I'd had a heart attack. Obviously, in real life, you'll know this patient, so you don't need to do this bit, but an OSCE, and you'll be like, oh, yes, so I had this chest pain, and my daughter brought me in, and they told me I had a heart attack, and they they put some plastic um, plastic tubes inside the blood vessels in my heart, they said, and that's that's where I'm now. And then you'll say something like, okay, so I'm here to talk to you about some medications that we're starting you on for you leave that you know have you been told that you're being that you're being started on some medication and she'll be like oh yes yeah yeah okay what do you what do you know about it oh they said some vague things about we're starting you on this and that and that okay so these are the medications you're being started on do you know anything about them have you been on them before what do you already know i love that question what do you already know because it applies to any understanding, uh, any sort of explaining station. You're explaining um, advanced decisions to a next of kin. What do you already know about this? You're explaining something to do with stats. What do you already know about this? That's an excellent question because it completely frames the level at which you're talking at. Inevitably, in an OSCE station, I'll say, I don't really know anything, but it's really good to ask it. You get a mark for it. And it's really, really good in real life. Okay. so. Sahaba said, um, I don't actually know anything about these. I don't actually know anything about these medicines. I've never taken any of them before. So now we're sticking on explaining medication. What should we, what's our next step? Imagine we were doing this one by one for each drug. So we know that she knows nothing about these medicines. She's never been on them before. What do we, what do we want her, what do we want to, how do we want to go through, go about this? Yeah, excellent. So tell her what the medications are. Ooh, that's a nice one. What is the athletics acronym? What is the athletics acronym? It's been a while since I've seen that one. In cases like this, acronyms are useful. I don't use an acronym because I like approaching it sort of systematically and I feel like this is quite an intuitive one for this which everybody else has everybody else has covered so step one like most of you have said what is what is the drug you know this is a drug called Ramipril some people might like to say how it works again depends on depends on your audience well you've basically covered everything well done so step two what you know what's it for so here is a drug 
this drug is called, this drug is called bisoprolol. We give it because it slows down people's heart rate and it makes it easier for it makes it easier for their heart to beat. We are giving you this drug because you've had a heart and because you've had a heart attack and that means that it's a bit harder for, it's going to be a bit harder for your heart to do its job now than it was before you had the heart attack so we want to make things as easy as possible for it going forward. So that's covered the how it help her how it help her symptoms. So we've done that. So we've said this is what the medicine's for. This is this is um, what's it? Yeah, this is what the medicine's for. This is why we've prescribed it. This is why we've prescribed it to you. Next step is telling the patient how long she'll be on the medicines for. So off those, you know, in terms of those medications, how long is she going to be on them for? Those five medicines. Have a look. Lifelong, except which one's not lifelong? Good, excellent. So lifelong, apart from Cloppy, which stops. Uh, so Cloppy is stopped. Excellent, and Cloppy is stopped. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So lifelong, except Cloppy. Uh, so the clopidogrel or the decagrel or the prosugrel, whichever one you're prescribing other than the aspirin will stop after a year so this depends on the type of stent that's been put in so if it's a regular stent it stops after a year if it's a drug eluting stent so there are certain stents which um secrete uh anti-platelets medication then it's six months so depending on the stent she's had it's either six months or one year that she's taking the, uh, the clopidogrel for excellent okay so that's how long Common side effects. So let's think about this. Ramipril, common side effects. Hit me. Break off. Yes, good. What else? And what's the common side effect of any, any hypotensive? We're all answering so well, I can't actually see. Yeah, good. Hypotension, you've said cop. So hyperkalemia, good. So hypertension is the very common one to warn, to warn her about. And then we've also got the fact that she might get a cough. Okay, good. Next, bisoprolol, common side effects for that. Bradycardia, good. What else? We've already said stuff like her blood pressure dropped low. What happens when people's drug blood pressure drops low? What do they feel? Cold fingers, good. Yes, cold extremities, nice. Yes, cold peripheries. Don't worry, so am I. You don't just think it, you know it. That's two times in a row, well done. Uh, good. Sleep disturbance, good. Lethargy, wonderful. Erectile dysfunction, nightmares, correct, yes. So erectile dysfunction in men can just lead to a degree of um, sexual dysfunction in general. So because the sympathetic nervous system modulates orgasms, women can get anorgasmia and men can get anorgasmia and men will get erectile dysfunction as well. So warning people generally do be mindful of warning people about sexual side effects. There are lots of complaints about people not getting, you know, oh, I started this drug and nobody told me that it would kill my libido or I started this drug and nobody told me that it would make it hard for me to get erections. So don't skirt around them because people do complain about that. And everyone obviously has a right to know. So common side effects, good. Uh, atorvastatin, what's common? Don't tell me the serious ones, tell me what's common. Yeah, my algae, excellent, good. Uh, and then we've got, yeah, break my algae. Myopathy, myopathy on the more serious side of things. Cool. Uh, aspirin and clopidogrel. What's the common side effect going to be? Yeah. The common side effect is also the wood buys up will be contraindicated. Yeah, so beta blockers are not a good idea in people with Raynaud's. Excellent. Yeah, 
a good question, so Omar. So it, be, it makes things a bit difficult because beta blockers aren't a good idea in Reynolds. Uh, ulcers and bleeding. Excellent. Good. Ulcers and bleeding are also the serious side effects of uh, as uh, aspirin and bleeding is a serious side effect of clopidogrel. Uh, serious side effects of bisoprolol, what people have already touched on, uh, bradycardia, so heart block. Serious side effects of ramipril, people already touched on, um, people already touched on hyperkalemia. Good. And then serious side effect of atorvastatin. What's the serious side effect of it? Well, serious side effects of atorvastatin. Rabdo and the other one. What's the other one, guys? What organ can statins really mess up? Good, perfect. Hepatotoxicity. So if you can get hepatotoxicity, well done. Perfect. So when you inform somebody about something with serious side effects, you tell them, oh, these are the serious side effects. What is then the single most important thing you need to be doing? Safety netting, excellent. Safety netting is the single most important thing. So reassuring that common, you know, this is a common symptom. It might be alarming, but it's common. These, this is a serious symptom. If this happens, I need you to come back or I need you to go to A&E, for example. So safety netting, it, what happens when you experience these side effects? So for example, cough, dramacryl, this is normal, but if it starts to bother, if it starts to bother you, then you can go to your GP and they might be able to switch it for a different medication. However, if you are having muscle pain, which is not going away and you're feeling really unwell, go to the emergency department. You might be having rhabdomyolysis. I'm not saying that. OK, perfect. Uh, what goes hand in hand is with any medication which has potential serious side effects is monitoring. And somebody mentioned earlier if they need any monitoring. Uh, which one of these medications need any sort of uh, monitoring attached to them, if any? Good, statins. Statins and the ramipril. Good. So statins, the LFTs at baseline in three months. And what does ramipril need? Oh, yeah, ten at 12 months. Good spot. And use knees, and when do we need to do the use knees for Ranipril? So it's at baseline and two weeks. And we're looking at the GFR and the creatinine. If you started the Ranipril for somebody and two weeks later their creatinine's gone up and their GFR is blocked. What might they have? Why might it be that their renal function has deteriorated? Yeah, good. So they might have renal artery stenosis. Uh, if they are a person who is older, you know, who's in their 50s, why might they have renal artery stenosis? 50s, 60s, 70s, what's the most common cause of renal artery stenosis in that age group? Good atherosclerosis. If they're a you know, young person, say a woman perhaps, what's the most common cause there? Fibromuscular dysplasia or something. Yes, it is the fibromuscular dysplasia. Perfect. Yeah, good. No, you got it right. Yes. That's, yeah, perfect. Well done. Um, so fibromuscular dysplasia, which is just a sort of in, uh, not even inherited it's just a rare problem where the muscle in your blood in your blood vessels just becomes dysplastic so you get those that beaded appearance on angiography perfect so say you're you're going to need a blood test you'll have she'll have her baseline blood test from the hospital and we'll ask your gp to organize blood tests for you for two weeks for this medication for three months for this medication so follow up good Somebody has mentioned avoidance of certain things. So when you're on a certain medication, there are certain things you're going to have to avoid. So certain foods um, or drinks. So for example, if you're on 
something which is affected by the P450 uh, system, then obviously grapefruit and cranberry juices are a problem. Certain activities. Um, so who can think of certain activities that need to be avoided in terms of being on a certain class of drugs? Because activities is an interesting one. Why might certain people not be allowed to do certain activities whilst they're on certain medications? Yeah, excellent, good. So that's the that's one of the two big ones. So if somebody is on an anticoagulant, avoid contact sports. If some, and then the other big one is driving, driving and heavy machinery. If someone is on a medication which makes them sleepier or affects their consciousness or reflexes, then it's probably going to affect their ability to drive, their ability to operate heavy machinery. So if that's relevant, always mention it. Other things to talk about, if a patient's on a medication that can't just be stopped, cold turkey. So what's a very good example of that kind of medication? Steroids, yes, wonderful. Never forget the steroids can't be stopped straight away. Excellent. Then you will always get marks for doing a, if it hasn't already been, if you haven't already been explicitly told, don't take a drug history or whatever, then there is no issue with if you feel you have time asking, do you take any other medications at the moment? Are you allergic to anything? What's the important thing? If somebody says, I am allergic to a medicine, what do you need to do? What reaction? Perfect, good, because there is a different difference between I am intolerant when I take penicillin, I get really bad diarrhea, and when I took penicillin, I nearly died. So excellent, good, because that's sometimes forgotten. What's the other important thing to ask about when you're taking a drug history? Are you taking any medications? Yes, my doctor prescribes me this. Are you allergic to anything? No. What else do I need to ask about? And actually applies for a drug you're talking about earlier. Over the internet or counter. That's actually really good. Nobody's ever mentioned over the internet. Excellent. That's really, really good. People nowadays just buy stuff over the internet. The problem is half the time you don't actually know what you're buying, but sometimes you do. And that's really important to ask about, especially with NSAIDs, because you ask them, are you taking anything? You prescribe anything? No. You take anything over the counter? Yes. What? Ibuprofen? How long? Six months? Oh my God, that's why you're bleeding. So perfect. That's good. And then everything else is basically just ice. And after each stage, and this is the thing that gets you so many marks in communication stations, chunk and check, stop. Has what I told you made sense? And then the last bit, which is closing off the consultation, is you've already done safety netting, reminding, so summarizing, and or offering the opportunity for follow-up or further information. So further information is stuff like leaflets, and in this case, her follow up is going to be you'll see your GP at six, uh, at, in two weeks time. If they don't contact you, then please book an appointment with them because it's important your GP follows you up. So that's all on here. With any explain, explaining station, that's everything we've talked about. Any explaining station, really, the important stuff is check their level of understanding. Pause after each point you make to see if they've got any questions, if they understand everything. And then summarize, summarizing at the end, sorry, summarizing at the end and giving them the opportunity to ask any questions and just say that you give them a leaflet. And you won't just pass those stations, you'll do really, 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 really well in those. Uh, to do this on a five minute station, absolutely. If it was just one medication in a five minute station, then that's doable. So if you were just doing Ramapril, you can do that in a five minute station. Five, five of them in a five minute station, they're never going to do that to you. They will ask you to do something like, oh, this patient's been, you know, this patient's been started on a week's worth of, of um, Colmox. Counsel them on that, or they're started on Torvastatin. They'll give you one medicine. But yeah, so that brings us to the end of the actual, so we've talked about prescribing stuff, we've talked about uh, medication counseling, or just in general, things for an explanation station. What I am going to do, actually, I just need to stop the recording at this point. Um, to do. So.